Ari. Welcome back for... Hi, Ari. Welcome back for Chapter 7 of Enola Holmes. In Chapter 6, we found out that Enola's mom had actually left her a note or multiple notes before she left. She had given her a cipher for her birthday and every cipher was a different note to Enola. So she has left her money in various spots in the house and Enola is starting to piece together why her mom left and make a plan of her own. So, chapter seven. Five weeks later, I was ready. That is to say, in the eyes of Ferndale Hall, I was ready to go to boarding school. And in my own mind, I was ready for a venture of quite a different sort. Regarding boarding school, the seamstress had arrived from London, settled herself in a long vacant room once occupied by a lady's maid, sighed over the treadle sewing machine, and then taken my measurements. Waist, 20, ish, 20 inches, too large. Chest, 21 inches, far too small. Hips, 22 inches, dreadfully inadequate. But all could be set right. In a fashionable publication my mother would never have allowed in Ferndale Hall, the seamstress located the following advertisement. Amplifier. Ideal corset for perfecting thin figures. Words cannot describe its charming effect, which is unapproachable and unattainable by any other corset in the world. Softly padded regulators inside, with other improvements combining softness, lightness and comfort, Regulate a wearer's pleasure, any desired fullness, with the graceful curves of a beautifully proportioned bust. Corset sent on approval in plain parcel, on receipt of remittance. Guaranteed. Money returned if not satisfied. Avoid worthless substitutes. This device was duly ordered, and the seamstress began to produce prim, dim-coloured dresses with high whalebone-ribbed collars to strangle me, waistbands designed to choke my breathing, and skirts which spread over half a dozen flounced silk petticoats trailed on the floor so that I could barely walk. She proposed to sew two dresses with a 19 and a half inch waist, then two with a 19 inch waist, and so on to 18 and a half inches and smaller in expectation that as I grew, I would diminish. Meanwhile, Increasingly terse telegrams from Sherlock Holmes reported no word of mother. He had tracked down her old friends, her fellow artists, her suffragist associates. He had even travelled to France to check with her distant relations, the Vernets, but all to no avail. I had begun to feel afraid for mum again. Why had the great detective not been able to locate her? Might some accident have befallen her after all? Or even worse? some foul crime? My thinking changed, however, upon the day the seamstress completed my first dress, at which time I was expected to put on the ideal corset, which had arrived as promised in discreet brown paper wrappings, with frontal and lateral regulators, plus, of course, a patent dress improver, so that never again would my back be able to rest against that of any chair I sat in. Also, I was expected to wear my hair in a chignon, secured with hairpins that dug into my scalp, with a fringe of false curls across my forehead, similarly skewered. As my reward, I got to put on my new dress, and in new shoes, just as torturous, toddle around the hall to practice being a young lady. That day I realised, with irrational yet complete certainty, where my mother had gone. Some place where there were no hairpins, no corsets, ideal or otherwise, and no patent dress improvers. Meanwhile, Brother Mycroft sent a telegram reporting that all was arranged. I was to present myself at such and such a finishing school, House of Horrors, and such and such a date, and instructing Lane to see to my getting there. More importantly, regarding my own venture, I spent my days as much as I could in a dressing gown, keeping to my room and napping, pleading nervous prostration. 
Mrs. Lane, who frequently offered me calves' foot jelly and the like, small wonder invalids waste away, grew so worried that she communicated with Mycroft, who assured her that boarding school, where I would breakfast upon oatmeal and wear wool next to my skin, would restore my health. Nevertheless, she summoned first the local apothecary, and later a Harley Street physician, all the way from London, neither of whom found anything wrong with me. Correctly enough, I was simply avoiding corsets, hairpins, tight shoes and the like, while making up for lost sleep. No one knew that every night, after I had heard the rest of the household go to bed, I got up and worked on my cipher book through the dark hours. I enjoyed the ciphers after all, for I loved finding things, and Mum's ciphers gave me a new way to do this, first discovering the hidden meaning, then the treasure. Each cipher I unraveled led me into Mum's rooms in search of more riches she had secreted for me. Some of the ciphers I could not solve, which frustrated me, so that I considered ripping the back of all Mum's watercolours, but that hardly seemed sporting. Although there were many, many, too many paintings, and moreover not all of the ciphers directed me to them. There was, for instance, a page in my cipher book decorated with ivy trailing along a picket fence. At once, without even looking at the cipher, I stole into Mother's rooms in search of a watercolour study of ivy. I found two and ripped the backing off both without success before I rather sullenly returned to my room and faced the cipher. A-O-E-O-L-I-M-E-S-O-K L-N-K-O-N-Y-D-B-B-N. What in the world? I looked up ivy in the meanings of flowers. The clinging vine stood for fidelity. Although touching, this knowledge did not help me. I scowled at the cipher for quite a while before I was able to pick out my name in the first three letters of the top line combined with the first two letters of the bottom line. Then I noticed how Mum had painted the ivy zigzagging in a rather unnatural manner up and down the picket fence. Also, the ivy grew from right to left. Rolling my eyes, I followed the same pattern and rewrote the cipher. K-N-O-B-S-B-E-D-M-Y-I-N-L-O-O-K-E-N-O-L-A Knobs, bed, my, in, look, Enola. Or, reading the words from right to left, Enola, look in my bed knobs. Off I went, tiptoeing through the night to remove the knobs from Mum's bed and discover that there was an astonishing amount of paper money that can be stuffed inside brass bedposts. I, in turn, had to find clever hiding places within my bedroom so that Mrs. Lane's occasional invasions with dust cloth would discover nothing. My curtain rods, made of brass like Mother's bed, with knobs on the ends, served the purpose, and all of this had to be done before the lanes rose at dawn. Altogether, my nights were far more active and satisfactory than my days. I did not ever find what I most desired. Any note of farewell, affectionate regard, or explanation explanation from Mum. But truly, at this point, not much explanation was needed. I knew that she had practised her deceptions for my sake, at least in part, and I knew that the money she had so cleverly slipped to me was meant to give me freedom. Thanks to Mum, therefore, it was in a surprisingly hopeful, if nervous, state of mind that one sunny morning in late August I mounted to the seat of the conveyance that was to take me away from the only home I had ever known. Lane had arranged with the local farmer for the loan of a horse and a kind of hybrid contraption, or trap, a luggage wagon with an upholstered seat for me and the driver. I was to travel to the railway station in comfort, if not in style. "'I hope it doesn't rain,' Mrs. Lane remarked, standing in the drive to see me off. It hadn't rained in weeks, not since the day I had gone searching for my mother. "'Unlikely.' said Lane, giving me his hand so that I could step up to my seat like a lady, one kid-gloved hand in his while the other lifted my white ruffled parasol. There's not a cloud in the sky. Smiling down on Lane and Mrs. Lane, I settled my first bustle, then myself, next to Dick, my driver. 
Just as my bustle occupied the back of the seat, Mrs. Lane had arranged my hair to occupy the back of my head, as was the fashion, so that my hat, rather like a beribboned straw dinner plate, tilted forward over my eyes. I wore a taupe suit I had chosen carefully for its nondescript, indeed ugly, colour, its nineteen and a half inch waistband, full skirt and concealing jacket. Beneath the jacket, I had left the skirt's waistband unbuttoned, so that I could corset myself as lightly as possible, almost comfortably. I could breathe, as would be needful very soon. "'You look every inch of a young lady, Miss Enola,' said Lane, standing back. "'You'll be a credit to Ferndale Hall, I'm sure.' Little did he know. "'We'll miss you.' quavered Mrs. Lane for a moment. My heart reproached me, for I saw tears on her soft old face. "'Thank you,' I said rather stiffly, starching myself against my own emotion. "'Dick, drive on.' All the way to the gate I stared at the horse's ears. My brother Mycroft had hired men to clean up the lawn of the estate, and I did not want to see it with my wild rose bushes cut down. "'Good boy, Miss Enola, and good luck,' said the lodge keeper as he opened the gates for us. "'Thank you, Cooper.' As the horse trotted through Kinniford, I sighed and allowed my glance to roam, taking a farewell look at the butcher's shop, the greengrocer's shop, black-beamed, whitewashed, thatched cottages, public house, post office and telegraph office, constabulary, more Tudor cottages with tiny windows scowling under their heavy straw forelocks, the inn, the smithy, the vicarage, the granite chapel with its mossy slate roof, headstones tilting this way and that in the graveyard. I let us trot almost past before I said suddenly, as if I had just at that moment thought of it, Dick, stop! I wish to say goodbye to my father. He pulled the horse to a halt. What was that, Miss Enola? When dealing with Dick, full and simple explanations were necessary. I wish to visit my father's grave, I told him one patient word at a time, and say a prayer for him in the chapel. Poor father. He would not have desired such prayers. As a logician and an unbeliever, Mum had once told me he had not desired a funeral. His request had been for cremation, but after his demise his wishes had been overruled for fear that Kinniford might never recover from the scandal. In his slow, worried way, Dick said, I want to drive you to the railway station, miss. There is plenty of time. You can have a pint at the public house while you're waiting for me. Oh, I. He turned the horse, backtracked, and drew up at the door of the chapel. We sat for a moment before he remembered his manners, but then he secured the reins, got down, and came around to my side to help me descend. Thank you, I told him as I withdrew my gloved hand from his grubby fist. Come back for me in ten minutes. Nonsense. I knew he'd be half an hour or more in the public house. Yes, miss. He touched his cap. He drove away, and amid a swirl of skirts, I minced into the chapel. As I had expected and hoped, I found it unoccupied. After scanning the empty pews, I grinned, tossed my parasol into the cast-off clothing for the poor box, hoisted my skirts above my knees and dashed for the back door and out into the sunlit graveyard. Down a twisting path worn beneath, between the tottering headstones I ran, keeping the chapel between me and any witness who might be passing upon the village street. When I reached the hedge at the bottom of the chapel grounds, I leapt more than climbed the stile, turned right, ran a bit farther, and yes, indeed, yes! There waited my bicycle, hidden in the hedge where I had left it yesterday, or rather, yesternight, in the small hours by the light of a nearly full moon. On the bicycle were mounted two containers, a basket in front and a box in back, both packed full of sandwiches, pickles, hard-boiled eggs, water flask, bandaging in case of accident, tire repair kit, knickerbockers, my comfortable old black boots, toothbrush, and such. On my person, also were mounted two containers, hidden beneath the taupe suit, one in front, one in back. The one in front was a quite unique bust enhancer that I had secretly hand-sewn for myself out of materials purloined from Mum's wardrobe. 
For the container in back, I had devised a dress improver of like sort. Why, leaving home had my mother worn a bustle, yet left its horsehair stuffing behind. The answer seemed obvious to me. In order to conceal in the dress improver's place the baggage necessary for running away. And I, being blessed with a flat chest, had carried her example a step further. My various and proper regulators, enhancers and improvers remained in Ferndale Hall, stuffed up my chimney, actually. In their places upon my person, I wore cloth containers, baggage, in effect, filled with unmentionables, wrapped around bundles of banknotes. In addition, I had folded a carefully chosen spare dress and secured it to my back between my petticoats, where it perfectly filled my train. In the pockets of my suit, I had a handkerchief, a cake of soap, comb and hairbrush, my now precious booklet of ciphers, smelling salts, energy-sustaining candies. Indeed, I bore a steamer trunk's worth of essentials. Hopping onto my bicycle, letting my petticoats and skirts modestly drape my ankles, I pedalled off across country. A good cyclist does not need a road. I would follow the farm lanes and pasture lands for the time being. The ground was baked hard as iron. I would leave no tracks. By tomorrow, I imagined, my brother, the great detective, Sherlock Holmes, would be attempting to locate a missing sister, as well as a missing mother. He would expect me to flee from him. Therefore, I would not. I would flee towards him. He lived in London. So did Mycroft. On that account, and also because it was the world's largest and most dangerous city, it was the last place on earth either of them would expect me to venture. Therefore, I would go there. They would expect me to disguise myself as a boy. Very likely they had heard about my knickerbockers, and anyway, in Shakespeare and other works of fiction, Runaway girls always disguise themselves as boys. Therefore, I would not. I would disguise myself as the last thing my, brother, my brothers would think I could. Having met me as a plain beanpole of a child in a frock that barely covered my knees. I would disguise myself as a grown woman. And then I would set about finding my mother. That's chapter seven. <gasps> It would seem Enola has decided she is not going to boarding school. I don't blame her. Those dresses sounded awful. So she's taken her money, she stored her bike, and she's running away. And next she thinks that her brothers are going to come looking for her. So I believe in chapter eight, we'll see Enola get to London, hopefully. Okay, see you next time. Love you.